in thinking about health, in my own mind years ago, I was wrestling with what, what it means to be healthy. And I kind of came up with, again, a triune. You kind of think of, Casey said, in a three-dimensional world, we tend to think in threes, physical, mental, spiritual, father, son, spirit, and so forth. And so in, in terms of health, in my mind, I was thinking health, when I really got into it, was wholeness, balance, and growth. Kind of, that covered everything that I could imagine about health. And if you've been noticing the talks so far, we've, you've heard a lot about wholeness, I think, and to know yourself, to be yourself, and one with the whole and the whole physical, mental, spiritual, and so forth. And today, of course, the talk's going to be on balance, so I'll be addressing that aspect a lot. And the growth aspect in terms of using the will to make choices and grow and learn as a soul uh, was quite a bit in that healthy self-talk. Um, and so to summarize it, all the parts are there, and they work together harmoniously for the full development of the entity. Um, thinking about health. So in the talk this morning... One of the themes that's going to come out of that is physical, mental, and spiritual and how to get them coordinated in a balanced way for health. Someone asked for instructions that they can keep themselves in good health through mind power now latent in self. Casey said, by keeping an equal balance in the physical, mental, and spiritual aspects of the body functioning. To be sure, it is necessary for the normal physical functioning. It is necessary for normal physical reactions or the exercise as relaxation in same. That's 2533-3. The same reading continuing. The same should apply also to the mental and also to the spiritual aspects. For they are one. They are one. A really important point that we're going to be looking at more closely. But keep a normal balance, not being an extremist in any direction, whether in diet, exercise, spirituality, or morality. But in all, let there be a coordinate influence for every phase of the physical, mental, and spiritual life is dependent upon the other. Hmm. Okay, so we still have this triune model, physical, mental, and spiritual, but they are one. We can think of them because we're three-dimensional and a three-dimensional consciousness sort of separately, and we can address them that way, but we must not lose track that they are one. So I'm going to do a little experiment right now. You noticed I was messing around up here. And, and from a research background, I like, to, I like to try things out. I've done this experiment a few times. It is an experiment. I don't know how this is going to turn out because you're a different group than I've ever worked with. And so we're going to, what we're going to do, we're talking about mental, physical, and spiritual and so forth and the power of the mind you've heard over and over at Casey Talks. What I want to do, I've set up this little cold coin here and I've got it suspended. And I want to just, if somebody will be the timer, maybe... Keep track for maybe a minute. Let's spend a minute in whatever kind of concentration you want. From a mental standpoint, I want that coal coin to swing. Okay? I want that coal coin to swing. So you can meditate, you can focus, you can visualize however you like. For, let's do it for one minute and see if we can get It's moving just a little just because of the airflow. But I actually want it to swing pretty obviously. Okay? So are we ready? Okay, it's been about a minute. Now, if we were to go on for several minutes or an hour or two, maybe that would have more of an influence, but we're not getting a lot of movement, would you say? Okay. And that's the way the experiment... I've done this a number of times, and I have done it you know, in long, in, for longer periods of times in classroom settings and so forth. But what's this? This is really important. What's this? Do you see it moving now? I did that with my mind. I did that with my mind. Physical, mental, spiritual, they are one. Remember? I said I read that somewhere. Okay. They are one, for they are one. And I, and I say I did that with my mind because if you do things in a physical way and, and you're mindful about it, and if, you're, if you have a purpose for doing it, that the purpose is spirit. Purpose meaning value, motivation, desire. Those are all spiritual attributes. So if you have a purpose for doing something and you do it in a mindful way, you're alert and aware and you have a reason. You might visualize it and so forth. You use the mind in various ways. But you engage the mind. And, and even at a physical level, 
that, in, that required, that coordination required my nervous system. And, Kate, and that's part of the mind. That requires my mind to coordinate the nerve impulse. You understand? And also the mindfulness of just, I spent a lot of thought into this before I did this this morning. It wasn't just, it wasn't rote. This wasn't mechanical. I used, I engaged my mind, engaged spirit. That was a holistic act I did. And this is so important in living the balanced life, and particularly when you're dealing with health issues. In the Casey readings, over and over, he would say, when you do a therapy, don't do it as just a physical thing, or don't do it in a rote way, or a mechanical way. Don't just go on automatic pilot, oh, I've given this massage before, or whatever. He said, you know, engage spirit and mind in the process, and in some cases he said, if you don't do that, don't even bother. You know, if you're going to do it as rote, don't even bother, because you'll lose the power of the spirit and the mind. But they are one. And when we're in physical bodies, if we want to keep a balance, that can be very helpful as one, to work that way. Be mindful as you're doing it and do things purposefully. You see? Sometimes, as spiritual, mental, physical beings, sometimes we can get more focused in one area than the other. And we tend to be that way. Me, I tend to be a pretty mental person. I mean, my degrees in psychology and so forth, and I'm sure I have some planetary sojourns in Mercury, and so I tend to be a very mental kind of person, so it's something I've wrestled with in the Casey readings of becoming more whole, you see, engaging spirit and, and the physical, because as I, even in the mental health readings, as I showed you yesterday, when I was looking at anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, there would just be tons and tons of physical application there for what you think of as a mental illness. And so how to engage that and become a whole person in oneness, physical, mental, spiritual, while you're doing it, while you're giving those suggestive therapeutics we talked about yesterday, or whatever it happens to be, to engage spirit and mind while you're doing it. Only do things by doing them. Thinking them will not accomplish unless put into action. Activity brings strength. Overactivity may weaken the very thing attempted to be strengthened. Moderation in all things. Let that be for self and for others. A moderation in all things, that's a pretty common idea if you look through history at the various great you know, philosophers and traditions, the various um, the mystics and such. A Buddha had the middle way or the middle path. Socrates, choose the mean and avoid the extremes on either side as far as possible. The mean, the midpoint. <laughs> Aristotle talked about the golden mean a lot. And even Confucius and the doctrine of the mean. Now, I particularly like the story of Buddha, and there's a number of stories of Buddha, but one of, the fav- one of my favorite stories of Buddha is moderation in all things and the, and the golden mean. Are you familiar with that, how, how that came to be for him? He started out in the wealthy, powerful, materialistic extreme, physical extreme, if you want to think of it in that way, in terms of having everything and opulence and you know, sensuality and all the stuff that goes along with that privileged lifestyle. And then he sees this poor, suffering individual it's a sick individual or whatever, and it completely throws him off, and he realizes he's missed something here, so he goes to an extreme. Probably had some past lives in Uranus, too, for those of you know the Uranus of extremes we've been talking about, perhaps. And then he becomes an ascetic, the opposite. And one, one uh, story of him was that he could live on a bean a day or something. He became very, I mean, he, he was the ascetic of the ascetics. I mean, the ascetics looked to him as their master because he could do it so well. He was so extreme at it that they just almost worshipped him as the ultimate ascetic, a deprivation of life, of all those things of, of material side. But that didn't satisfy him either. He was, apparently he was meditating, he was sitting by a river, and along comes a boat or a raft. And there's someone in the boat and the raft and they're playing a stringed instrument. And he hears that music, and it's so beautiful to him. And he has the realization that if the strings were too loose, they wouldn't be in harmony. He wouldn't have the music. Or if they were too tight, they wouldn't produce that beautiful music. But they had to be tuned just right. And that's where he got the idea of the, of the middle way or the middle path. Not too tight, not too loose, not too extreme, moderation in all things. Isn't that an interesting story? Beautiful story. I love that one from Buddha because it reminds me to keep in balance. And because I, I probably have some planetary soldiers in Uranus too, because I can go to extremes. My wife can testify to that. 
And so finding that middle way is so important in keeping your balance. Now, if, if, you know, if deep philosophy and Buddha and all that's too deep for you all, we always have Goldilocks. <laughs> and what's the story of Goldilocks? Yeah. You know, in the three bears, the little girl goes out wandering around the woods and gets lost and ends up in this cabin. Well, the, it's the bear's cabin, and they had prepared some for, uh, porridge to eat for breakfast, but it was too hot, and so they went for a walk while it cooled down. And she went in and found the three bowls, too hot, too cold, just right. So she ate that. And then she went to sit in the, the chairs, the three chairs. One's too, one's too tall, one's too wide, one's just right. So she sat in that. Of course, that's a little, the little bear's chair. And she broke it, so she probably ate too much porridge, perhaps. And then she's got a rest, so she goes to the, you know, find a place to lay down. One bed's too hard, one's too soft. The one's just right. And she's there asleep when the bears come back and they discovered the mess that she's made and startled her. And she goes running off and never comes back. But there you have it in a children's story, the golden mean, right? The middle, the middle way of Buddha in Goldilocks. Now, in working uh, with people in a mental health setting, in terms of keeping a balance and having these different aspects of life. Again, I go back to a triune kind of model, thinking in terms of three. And, and actually, some of this comes from Freud. Freud de- defined mental health uh, as a balance between work and love. And so if you add play to that, to balance it out, more from, even from the Casey perspective and others, I get a triune, work, love, and play. So when, when people would come, and if they, ha- if they could be anxious or depressed or whatever, or any, any kinds of problems, I would just do this as sort of a, an assessment to get a sense of where, you know, how they're doing in their lives. Are they balanced or not? Do they have something going on? So I'd ask them about work. Do, what activity do you do that makes the world a better place? It may or may not be a job. I mean, work. So it could be at home. It could be volunteer type of activity. It could be any type of activity. But do you, does it make the world a better place? If it is, then that's your work. Do you have that in your life? Some people don't have that in their life. They're missing out on that. You see, that's a missing area. How about love, relationships, connection to others, caring and giving? That's kind of like that healthy self-talk I gave yesterday, right? So what do you have going on in the love area? Some people can't put anything in that column. This is almost like the ideals exercise where you make three columns and listen under that, what you have going in your life. And then, of course, play, recreation, relaxation, entertainment, or fun. Do you have some of that? Now, that's, that's a struggle for me because I tend to be a little bit of a workaholic, as you might well imagine, with all the stuff that I do. So how do I incorporate, to stay in balance, how do I incorporate some of that in my life? So that's something I consciously do to stay in balance. Now, Edgar Casey talked about work with some of the people who came to him. And one individual, am I working too hard for my best physical welfare? Answer, few people have ever injured themselves by work. (laughs) Many have by worry as combined with work, but take the periods of rest and recuperate properly. Pretty common sense, huh? Stress management there from Edgar Casey. Well, that the body rather balance or budget its own mental and physical activities for its time for recreation, for receiving, for its own entertainment. Edgar Casey's recommending entertainment here. Interesting. I never thought I'd see that in a reading. For its own mental and physical improvements and for its activities and the caring for the disturbing forces that occur at this period. Now, this woman's going through menopause, so she's going through some biological stress as well as change, various changes in her life. But do not ever let any of these activities become rote, you see? Don't let it become rote if you're going to do these things. Do them mindfully. Do them with a purpose. Budgeting time, a time to laugh, a time to work, a time to play, time to give relaxation, time to take relaxation. Time to recuperate, time for song, time for crying, time for all things. This is what is meant by budgeting the time. There's a Bible verse like that, isn't there? Yeah, I think there was a rock and roll song kind of like that too, right? So that's an old idea. It's been around. Budget the time, the activity, so as to keep a well-balanced life. Experience in all phases of its mental and physical activity. But take the time for the work for the play, for recreation, for improvement in every activity or manner. These are those that keep a body well-balanced. Has the work hurt the nervous condition? As indicated, there is too much work and too much worry to 
to the amount of play and relaxation it's taken. Better divide it up. Did you find the master worked continually, or did he take time to play and time to relax? He is a good example in everyone's life. Casey liked to bring the master in, if he could, whenever he could. Now, in terms of work, love, and play on the love aspect, I think I touched on this with, uh, with regard to anxiety yesterday, in terms of perfect love casts out fear, fear and anxiety. And so sometimes I do this as an assessment with people, in terms of if that love column comes up kind of blank and they're, you know, they're not making these connections in relationships and love, I actually use this Bible verse and ask them, you know, tell me about love of God. Do you love God or do you have a sense of relationship with God and love with God in your life? I ask them about love of others. Who are you connected with in your life? Are there those connections? And, of course, love of self gets into that self-esteem, self-respect thing that we were talking about yesterday as well. So it, it gives me a nice way just to very quickly and succinctly to get people thinking about love in a very practical way and be able to assess themselves because they're answering the questions. I ask them, I don't, you know, this is part of me getting to know them. And sometimes they get to know themselves that way as well. Now, you've heard me talking a lot about ideals in terms of, the healthy self, and so forth. And sometimes even the physical balance, as well as the purposes and spiritual ideals, come into play in in keeping a balance in life. I assume that you're pretty familiar with ideals. Show of hands. Anybody this is like totally new that you never heard and I talk about ideals? Because we did have a couple new people here. So... The ideals and the ideals exercise are a wonderful way to keep the physical and mental and spiritual balanced. This individual uh, asked about weakening of of mental powers of will, concentration, and memory. Casey said, this is the reflex from poisons that act upon the bloodstream. It is an attitude as well as a physical reaction, psychosomatic. Hence, keep the mental attitude ever of a constructive nature, knowing, feeling, acting that the creative or spiritual forces within self are able to keep a balance. If there is the coordinating of self in its activities to and with its spiritual and mental ideals. That's where the ideals come into play in keeping this balance, physical, mental, and spiritual. Keep that creative attitude towards helpfulness to others. These are the better, and these will keep the balance in the body forces. So when we talked about the healthy self yesterday, and we came to the part where we're talking about being selfless and giving to others, that we only have what we give away, give and you shall receive. So by being helpful to others, we actually enhance, enhance our own sense of self. We help ourselves. That's what we're talking about. Now, In terms of, from a mental health standpoint, in quite a few of those readings where people were having mental problems, he would actually use the term that you're mentally unbalanced. He would, instead of saying you have a mental illness or whatever, he'd say, you know, the person is mentally unbalanced. Something's out of balance mentally. And here's a case. This is a wonderful reading given for a woman, and she came and brought her children in when she was getting the reading. And almost the whole reading is about balance in one way or another. Balanced lifestyle, including, I think she asked about financial, how to keep a balance there in terms of various sort of problems that she was encountering. And, and the, one of the children actually had an anemia problem, physical problem, and Casey commented on getting, getting help for that to get that back in balance. And one of the, the children, um, she was considering having them go away to school. And she was a little concerned about that, whether or not the child could handle it or not. And so Casey said, there are bodies who, that with, with a little learning, without the proper balance to apply that learning, makes for madness or an unbalancing of the mental body as related to physical and spiritual well-being. No man, no one may learn too much unless the learning is not assimilated and able to be used. So... Again, keeping a balance, even in the mental, as we learn a lot, quite a few readings. Have you seen those where he said you can learn too much, but if you don't apply it, it actually can become sin or it can actually be a problem for you if you don't apply it? Now, in this particular case, he gave this as a, as a caution, and he went on to say, for this individual, your child's not going to have a problem here. 
but apparently that was a worry in her mind for some reason. And so he explained it in terms that she could understand, yes, if you learn and don't apply it, it can become unbalanced. It can be a problem, but don't worry about your child. It has enough balance. It'll know what to do, and it's going to be okay. Go ahead and send your child away to school. And so I've been talking about physical, mental, and spiritual. I'm going to take the rest of my talk this morning. I'm going to focus quite a bit on the physical side, but we keep in mind it's all one, physical, mental, and spiritual. And I'm going to focus on things that are practical to me from my own experience, things that I've used to help stay in balance over the years. And we'll start out with the, the radial appliance, the radioactive. And this is the one, you know, the first night I... One of the reasons I did so much research on that was because I wanted to know how to use it with other people, and I wanted to use it for myself in a reasonable way. Now, Casey gave a lot of readings explaining what the radial appliance or the radioactive appliance, if you want to use that term, what it did, how it worked. And a lot of it had to do with coordination and balance. And, the, and in the use of the appliance, and, and it aids in making for the an equalization in the sympathetic and vegetative nerve system, used that as a period of meditation. For there is created a balance in the flows through the circuitry, a circulatory system, and the coordination is being created. We may, we may make for greater constructive experiences as well as the manifestations of same in the emotional as well as the physical forces of the body. Now, in, I'm, I'm working on a project uh, for Kevin, uh, Search for God, trying to sort of recreate that in a little different format. And, of course, one of the first parts of that is learning how to meditate or what meditation is. So I took all of the, all of the readings that mention meditation put them all in a big file, laid them out chronologically, which, which I typically do, so I can see any patterns, how things evolved. And it was very interesting because for about the first 10 years or so, when Edgar Casey mentioned meditation, he, um, it tended to be more of a stress management, relaxation sort of thing for people who are having physical problems because he's giving a lot of physical readings here in those first 10 years from 1921, 22, on up to you know, through the hospital, 1930, 31, and through there. So you tend to get that quality, and there's not much really in terms of what we would think of as meditation of the Lord's Prayer and opening the centers and raising the energy and so forth. For that first 10 years, you, you see hardly any of that. It's only with, when the Search for God group and the Glad Helpers come along, and there's a different emphasis here toward more of the mental and spiritual, and then the meditation readings really kind of change pretty dramatically. And that's where we get the opening of the centers and, and the revelation as well, because the center, the spiritual centers and all that's in the revelation as well. And then as you follow that along, I found a period where he was actually recommending this radial appliance over and over as an aid to meditation to keep a balance. And he would encourage people to use this appliance and while they're using it to meditate. And I've found that to be very helpful for me in keeping a balance, sometimes when I feel, if I'm getting out of balance, feeling stressed out, to use the appliance, and while I'm doing it, meditate. And there's a whole, from about 1935 on, it seemed like there was almost every time meditation is mentioned, it's mentioned in this context of using it with this appliance. Now, I said what this appliance does is that it, um, you get the same effect from the, the appliance that you get from a good night's sleep. He says, typically... Uh, during day, daily activities, we tend to get out of balance in one way or another because we tend to use our body in habitual ways. So if you're working in a factory and you're sitting there, standing there working a machine like this, well, your arm's going to you know, use more energy, build up more drosses, and it's going to become out of balance in a way. Or if you're sitting on your butt in a chair in an office or whatever, you're going to get out of a balance like Peter was talking about in some of you know, some of the people that come to him. They get out of balance in certain ways just because of using their body in habitual ways all day long. Now, the person that goes out and is very active and, and doing a lot of stretching so forth, they probably never need this appliance because they're going to keep pretty well balanced and uh, get a good night's sleep. So some of the people that came and Edgar Casey recommended this appliance, he said the body will get out of balance during the day. This appliance will just kind of even things back out so they get a fresh start, reboot the system, balance the system uh, by using this for an hour or two, and you get the same effect as having a good night's sleep. Because that's what happens during normal sleep. The system sort of balances itself back out so you can start the next day fresh. 
And if that doesn't happen, then you wake up in the morning, if, no matter how many hours you've been asleep, if that rebalancing doesn't happen, then you don't wake up refreshed and feeling like you've had a good night's sleep. Is it necessary for the body to take the radioactive battery treatment? The radioactive battery would be good for everybody and especially and be and would be especially good for this body. This assists in keeping an equilibrium, another term for balance. Not that it is a curative, but it is certainly a preventative. Would a radioactive appliance be beneficial? Of course, the radioactive appliance is beneficial to everybody, as we have given. Such applications would be more to keep a balance. Shall I take hypnotics to aid me in relaxation and sleep? Get farther and farther from these as fast as possible. But do not make self unbalanced in its mental relaxation by staying off, as it were, too long. But with the use of the radioactive appliance, this will be as a hypnotic that is created from within rather from without. Now, he said this appliance, he says... Sometimes it's called a battery, but he said don't call it a battery because it doesn't produce any energy of its own. He said it takes the body's own energy and recirculates the body's own energy. And so it comes from within rather than like a drug, a sleep aid or something that you're going to impose on the system. This is the body's own energy that's going to be rebalanced through this appliance. It works sort of like a magnet, he said. And when you attach it to the body... The way you rotate it around, I'm probably preaching to the choir here. You've all, how many of you use the radio appliance? Oh, you all know this. So it's right and left, top and bottom. So you really, by cycling this around, you really do balance left and right, top and body, bottom as you're making the cycle. And he said to keep it moving. Don't use it in one place all the time or you'll get out of balance. So I found the, the radio appliance to be a wonderful aid for me for meditation and for keeping a balance over the years. And I used to do, this is, now this is one of those activities, I was telling you about my daughter and getting her in, involved in the, the spiritual stuff and kind of redirected. One of the things I did with her before I took her on the trip to England with me was I, I used to have what's called appliance parties because to do research and to research these appliances, I had to build them from scratch with all the parts. And to buy one piece of steel you have to buy like 10 feet. They won't sell you one piece of carbon steel. So I had all everything I did, I had to buy it in a minimum quantity, which gave me enough to build like 100 or 150 appliances. So here I'm sitting to, for Doug Richards and I to do our research. I had all this material sitting around. So I, I had these appliance parties in, in the family room of my house, and people would come in, and we would have maybe 10 or 15 people, and we would make, have them make their own appliance take them through the steps, and by the time they get done in the evening, after two and a half, three hours, they would have their own appliance, which they built themselves. And of course, we meditated and had a proper mental, spiritual attitude because he said, you're putting your energy into the appliance. And I, and I had Cara, my daughter, she was my assistant. And so she was showing people how she built her own appliance, and she was showing them how to build their appliance. And one of my fondest memories is... is uh, to see her as she's going off to bed, and you put the appliance in a little pail with ice and water there, sloshing ice. Her going down, because she's only, you know, like that, and she's going down the hallway with this thing, and it's sloshing around, and she's taking her appliance to hook up to go to bed, you know? So it's one of those things as a parent, you think, well, that's a pretty good habit, you know? At least she knows how to do it if she wants to do it. So it's been an important part, an important sort of part of my life for a long time using these appliances. And now at a, exercise can also be used for balance. In, in general, exercise is great, for certainly. Sometimes you can be a little more specific. I don't know if Peter's talked about this, but in the Casey readings, sometimes he talked about balancing the upper and lower parts of the body and that there is a circadian rhythm to that, that during the day the circulation tends to go one way and, and vertically and horizontally in the upper and lower parts of the body. So for a lot of people, he recommended of the morning the exercise for the upper portion of the body, of the evening before retiring exercise from the waist down. Only a few minutes, of course, necessary, morning and evening, that would equalize the circulation. And there was a point in my life where I, I felt that I was having that type of imbalance. And so I got up my Harold Riley and read Riley and, and did some searches and actually used those exercises that way for a period of about three or four weeks. And I used the appliance as well, so it's hard to tell you know, what the balancing, but I felt the exercises were very helpful for me during that point in my life to get my body back in balance. Of course, walking um, every day, he said walking is the best exercise. 
and that's a, that's a good one to do. My wife and I like to walk in the evenings. You, it's just, it's hard to get yourself hurt too much if you just are reasonable about it. And it does, if you, you know, get your body into it, and if you do it in a mindful way, as you're walking for a purpose, and you're paying attention with your mind while you're walking, or maybe carrying on a dialogue of some, of some, if you're walking with somebody, it actually can become a holistic sort of thing and not just something you do as rote. It can be even better. In terms of um, assimilations and eliminations, keeping a balance there, Casey talked about uh, the body reproduces itself in every phase of its experience. And he's talking about the diet, the 80% alkaline to the 20% acid reaction. Of course, is with normal eliminations near to normal, without accident, the body reproduces itself. So this is how you regenerate the cellular tissue of your body through assimilation and elimination. For as indicated ever, there is gradually a replenishing of every portion of the body if the proper balance is kept in the system so that the eliminations and the assimilations are, are such that each portion of the system may reproduce itself. And by the way, that's the, that reproducing, that's the, that's the spiritual aspect of the body. When the body reproduces itself, that he said, that's the activity of a gland. A gland is the part of the system that allows reproduction to take place. Therefore, almost any organ of the body could be considered a, a gland in terms of that it reproduces. That's the spiritual premise in the body. That's the God force in the body. And he actually talked about an electrical aspect of that around the cells when they divide. Describe that as the God force in the body that these, these appliances work with, for sure. If the assimilations and eliminations would be kept near normal in the human family, the days might be extended to whatever period as was so desired. For the system is builded by the assimilations of that which takes within and is able to bring resuscitation so long as the eliminations do not hinder. Now, somebody was sitting here the other day and asked me about this. Is that lady still here? There you are. You remember? And I said, you said, well, what if you're bringing the food in and it doesn't go out? What happened? You know, well, that's what he's talking about here. If you eat a lot, you don't pass it through and process it and eliminate it. That can lead to problems. If you're not getting enough nutrients in and you're eliminating, you become depleted. So how to keep that in a balance? So if the nutrients, the proper nutrients are coming in, being processed, used for the body, and eliminated, and the, the system is uh, re regenerative that way. But if you get out of balance in either, in either side, the body gets out of balance and then you can start to have illness. Now, the final section in talking about balance is um, I'm going to talk about pH and some research we did with Meridian Institute and some personal research that I did in that regard. Of course, you understand that acid alkaline, you know, acidity and alkalinity are measured on a scale 0 to 14, with 7 being neutral. That's just a, a general principle. And the blood. Normal blood varies between 7.35 and 7.45. So it's now, that's slightly on the alkaline side, you see, just slightly alkaline in the blood. Now, the different tissues, as, as um, Peter has noted, the different tissues of the body have their own optimal alkalinity or, you know, pH. But with the blood, it stays within that very narrow range. And if it gets outside of that very much at all, you get sick and die. I mean, this is, for some reason, it's really important that the blood stay within that very narrow range, just slightly alkaline. And so, to help that happen, we have some buffering systems in the body because the system, by what we eat and our lifestyle and exercise or lack of exercise, we can become more acid or alkaline, and yet we need to keep a balance within that very narrow range. So we have these buffering systems in the body that can make up the difference for a while. And the Respiratory system, by breathing, that affects your systemic pH. And the urinary system, by throwing off acids or alkaline, can help buffer the system as well. And so when you start talking about measuring systemic pH in a minute, using litmus paper or some type of measurement for the, for the saliva or the urine, see, these are the, you could be measuring the buffering systems to get a sense of how your body is trying to keep its balance. Are you too much on one side or the other? You've probably seen the pH of foods table in books and so forth with the ARE. This is one created by Dr. Eric Mean, Meridian Institute. When we were doing um, our various projects and people were coming in for, um, for our residential programs, 
And so this is the sort of thing we were recommending that they pay attention to instead of their, you know, as they were doing the diets. And of course, he had some things to say about disease and illness and pH. How can I overcome susceptibility to infections such as colds, influenza, etc.? As we have just indicated by keeping the body alkaline, only in acids do colds attack the body. Whenever I would read something like this, of course, I'd go to the medical literature and do my research, my background uh, literature review. And what I found out was, sure enough, the rhinoviruses, which produce most of your colds, and the influenza virus and so forth for flu, many of these viruses are, act exactly in that way. In order for them to bond with the host cell, you had to have an, an acidic condition. If it was alkaline condition, the virus would not bond to the host cell. It would not infect or attack the host cell. And this is in the mainstream medical literature. Very interesting. Of course, Casey was talking about this long before this in the literature. A body is more susceptible to cold with an excess of acidity or alkalinity but more susceptible in the case of excess acidity, for an alkalizing effect is destructive to the cold germ. What can I do to build resistance against head colds? Keep the normal acidity and alkalinity by occasionally taking the test with litmus paper, both from the urine and from the spittle. When there is the inclination for acidity, use any of the sodas or their derivatives, citrocarbonates, as would, be, as would make for producing a better balance. Thus we find the coals will be eliminated. We're going to come back to that. Hang on to that thought of litmus paper and measuring a spittle and um, litmus. And we'll come back to that with some Meridian Institute. But for right now, I just want to point out something else, just so you're clear about that when we talk about acid alkaline balance and pH, that they're, just like with the blood, has its narrow range, different parts of the body have their optimal range as well. And so with the mouth, Casey said, optimally, it should be a little bit alkaline. And he actually talked about chewing the food and getting the saliva with the food because it helps to start the, the breakdown and, and chewing the food, of course, and then and getting the saliva because it actually starts a digestive process. But he says also... And optimally, it starts to alkalize the food a little bit in the mouth. So it should be a little bit alkaline in your saliva. And then, of course, the food comes down into the stomach. And particularly in the upper part of the stomach, it's very acidic. It's probably the most acidic place in your body. And you need that to break down the foods. Okay, But just as it's passing through the stomach, it becomes more alkaline in the lower part of the stomach... And then by the time it passes into the small intestine, there's an influx of uh, pancreatic juices and so forth that alkalize it a great deal. Because otherwise, if that acidity from the stomach were to come down in your intestines, it would just eat up the walls because the acid's so strong. So your, your system normally has these checks and balances for different parts of even the GI tracts. So we're talking about assimilations and eliminations. The optimal pH, so that as the food passes through, uh, it, it, it has the right pH. So here's the explanation of the diagram I just showed you. In the alkaline state first, in the mouth, in the first processes of digestion, and then entering to the stomach, changing into that of an acid force, with a hydrochloric state in the lower and in, and entering, or should enter, in the intestine to be assimilated, or to produce assimilation from the foods taken in that lacteal state, which is more the alkaline, the lacteal state. Or, or that less acid than in the action of the stomach. So he's described that process of the GI tract here, of the picture that I just showed you. And there it is again. Now, I found this same description in an old osteopathic manual, how the pH changes as it passes through the GI tract, almost identical to what he explained. And so it gets back to Edgar Casey's psychic process and what is he tuning into to pick this stuff up? Is he making it up entirely on the fly or is he accessing resources with his consciousness? Which seems to be more the explanation in, in, in much of this. Now in terms of the test for pH balance, saliva and urine, we would keep these things as indicated, keeping a normal balance well at times to test the body with litmus paper, both through the spittle and through the urine, that there may be, as indicated, kept a tendency of balance rather than an excess in either direction. Now, you may have heard of the book Alkalize or Die and some other such books which kind of take a pretty extreme position in terms of 
excess, you know, avoiding the acidity at all costs and becoming alkaline. And notice what he's saying, avoid the extremes in either direction. Sort of like moderation in all things, like Buddhism, the middle way. Just slightly alkaline, but keep the balance. And we'll see why in a minute. What can be done for, uh, to keep him from catching cold so easily? Keep the acidity of the system below normal. Make the test the same with litmus paper from the kidney effusion or the urine, which, tends, which tended to turn out to be the optimal way when we started measuring it. So to, to do a Meridian Institute research project on this, we did get some... The litmus paper has a little problem, because you remember from maybe high school... If, I don't even know. Anybody, anybody do the, the litmus paper in high school, chemistry, whatever? Do you remember the blue and red or the blue and pink? And so it pretty much would go one way or the other, and it would tell you if it's acid or alkaline, but it wouldn't tell you how much. And, and those were trying to be a little bit alkaline uh, in, in terms of balance. And so instead of the litmus, the more modern version of this, this type of pH strips, which give the different color codes so you can actually grid, gradate it a little bit. Now, this is still, from a research standpoint, is a little tricky because you're dealing with colors, and that can be subjective, and is it this color or is it that color? It's not quite as precise. Uh, so what we ended up doing was uh, using pH uh, uh, digital testers, which we purchased from this company, because you can put that into a liquid, and it'll give you a readout digitally, like point, bump, 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 three or four places beyond the decimal point. So you can be very precise and say exactly how acid or alkaline it is. Notice the white cups. We'll come back to that. So now, there was a couple aspects of this. There was the personal experiment part, which was me. I was the primary guinea pig for that. So I, I did these tests and kept these journals and logs of everything that I ate and every time that I... I we tried to do the saliva and the urine, but what we found out, the saliva is harder to do. It's harder to get... Um, there's so many things that can, can confound it in terms of what you've eaten and whether you've brushed your teeth and you think of all the things that goes on in your mouth. Just to get a pure sample of saliva can be a little bit of a challenge from a, from a lifestyle standpoint. So we tended to focus more on the urine pH. It tended to be more consistent that you could get the readings. And so here's a typical day, you know, January 30th of 03, and there I've had some orange juice for breakfast and a soup and toast and some apple juice and some fruit in the evening, and noticed the, the urine pH. Now, it tended to, for me, it turned to start out pretty acid, and that's fairly common for a lot of people processing overnight. And it, for a lot of people, you start out acid, and then it becomes more alkaline as you go along. So that was one day. Here's one where I did strictly orange juice, because sometimes he talked about just doing a mono diet, and particularly getting cold, just drinking a lot of orange juice. So I did that as well. And I did the citrus diet three or four days, five days in a row of just citrus and measured my pH. And sure enough, notice how much more. Now that, that first one up there is still 5.5. I need to bump that over. But see how much it gets more up in the sevens, closer to seven, 7.2, 7.3. So we're actually getting that slightly alkaline state more often with the citrus. Well, you know the blood pH is... Now, we didn't... It's, it's not so easy to, to do blood pH unless you're taking blood samples all the time, which I can't do in my house. So unless you're in a controlled setting to really be like, almost like a hospital, to take the blood sample and then have all the safeguards with that, with taking blood samples and testing the pH of it, that becomes very expensive and hard to do. So we, we kind of assumed that since I'm still alive, I must have stayed 7.35 to 7.45... You know, now if I'd have died, maybe we'd you know we'd look back over the data and say, "Wow, you know, did he do something here?" But so I survived this experiment, and um, so we're assuming that's like that. And the point is, the system's making up the difference. So we're going to keep the blood. It's so important to keep the blood in that narrow range. And if you eat a lot of acidic food, then the system has the buffering systems have to make up the difference and throw off the acidity, like in the urine or something. So if you see a lot of acidity there, maybe your lifestyle's a little too acid. You see. Your tissues, because all your other tissues in the body besides the GI tract may be affected by this um, acidity or alkalinity. And in terms of cold or virus, then that gives a place for, for them to attack if it's a little acid in particular. So he talked about um, keeping a normal balance in relation to the acid and alkalines, not becoming over alkaline, for this may be worse than not sufficient. So this whole business of alkalize or die, you have to, 
avoid the extremes, moderation in all things. You can get too, too alkaline. And he actually said, I think I have a slide here, where he said, it's worse to be too alkaline than it is to be too acid. Most people aren't aware of that because they think, you know, they have a, uh, a very simplistic done. And here it is actually right here in terms of the diet. Just so there is, is in the keeping a tendency toward alkalinity. See? A tendency. Just a little bit of alkalinity. Not that this be overdone for too much alkalinity is worse than a tendency for acidity. And just to back up there a moment. Notice he's saying that it could become a disturbing force in the activities of the stomach itself. Remember, the stomach has to be very acidic. And so if you're keeping too alkaline, if the acids aren't strong enough in the stomach, they may not digest the food properly. So if you've got undigested food going through the GI tract, not a good thing. That's one aspect of this, uh, keeping a balance. And you can actually get too alkaline. Too much alkaline is often even worse in such conditions than too much acid. Test for acidity. Getting too close to the alkalinity, which is, as oft, indicated much worse than the acid. So I made my point there. Probably over made the point a little. But I want, did want to point that out in terms of keeping a balance. Sometimes we can have the wrong concept. And here is a case where there's a lack of thyroid secretion producing super alkalinity. Lack of the hydrochloric reaction from those portions of the duodenum that function with the body. So it's again, it's in the GI tract. And we have super alkalinity in a portion of the system causing the effect of arthritic tendencies from super alkalinity. So you can overdo it with super alkalinity, getting too alkaline. And here's super acidity caused by poor elimination. So it's not just the diet. We get back to that assimilations and eliminations and keeping a balance there. Um, is there any trouble being caused by my digestive system? Rather, the trouble is in the digestive system is caused by the super acidity from the lack of the proper eliminations and the toxic forces that are not purified by the circulation through the lungs. Remember, the lungs is part of the buffering system to help with the pH, and, and it's also part of the eliminating system where we throw off the toxins. I think I described that in a previous lecture. So keeping the eliminations and assimilations balanced and if you don't, you can end up with poor eliminations with toxicity causing super acidity. So it's not just the diet, it's other, other factors can come in as well to produce an imbalance. You've probably, you know, we've talked about the 80-20 diet, and I showed you some of that. You're all familiar with 80-20 diet, 80% alkaline? Okay. So 80, those foods that I showed you in the table a while ago, and I'm going to show you another table in a little bit, 80% of your foods on the alkaline side, 20 on the acid for most people, will tend to give you that slightly alkaline reaction. Boy, that acid stuff must really be good stuff, potent stuff, huh? That's all the good tasting stuff. We can only have a little bit of it, and you need a whole bunch of your salads, your, and your lettuce and carrots and celery and so forth. Uh, and that's the way it seems to be in life, isn't it? The bad stuff that always tastes so good. And you, yeah, yeah, it's too bad that bad stuff wasn't alkaline, huh? Then we'd all have it made. Yeah. And here's some alkaline forming foods. And as Peter said, it's not necessarily that the food itself is alkaline, it's the reaction or the formation. So, how does it, once it's taken in and assimilated in the body, does it produce alkalinity or does it produce acidity? Because you may have noticed before using citrus to alkalize. I mean, citrus, that's citric acid, oranges and lemons and grapefruit and stuff. That's acid if you just measure it. But the reaction or the formation when it's digested and assimilated is alkaline producing. And that's what we're interested in. Is it alkaline reacting or alkaline producing or not? That's, that's where it comes into play. And here's some acid-forming foods. And you can, this is kind of distilled from that table I showed you earlier. So you can get it from a table or a list like this. And there's a lot of sources for this. You can find it in circulating files, I think, in books. A lot of people have dealt with this. And, of course, it's not sometimes just what you eat. It's the combination that you eat. So the food combining, um, food combinations to avoid two or more starchy foods at the same meal, sugary foods and starchy foods, cereals and citrus fruit or, as, or juice, large quantities of starchy foods with meat or cheese. This can affect pH, so how you combine it. Particularly the cereals and citrus fruit, he said, would tend toward acid, acidity. Now, the citrus diet, we were thinking about... We were actually really looking into trying to do the citrus diet to test that hypothesis for colds and flu because they, uh, scientists do a lot of those studies in university medical schools. They actually take a, a group of people, they rent like a floor of a, a hotel usually, and they take them in there 
and they test them, and um, they actually take samples, and then they, they, they contaminate some of them with the rhinovirus or whatever virus they're testing, and, and then see how long it, you know, then they, they can test certain drugs, or they can test almost anything, but they actually intentionally infect part of the people and, and not some of the others. And so we were, and of course they've done some of this to test orange juice and stuff, but I don't know that they've ever done it because they were looking at vitamin C. So they were testing the hypothesis, if you get vitamin C and we infect you with the rhinovirus, will that prevent the rhinovirus from attacking the body? And pretty much what they found was no. But I don't know, we never could really determine whether they were actually testing citrus or not in terms of that alkaline reacting from the food. Um, and so we were contacting some of the medical schools to try to set it up. It's pretty expensive to do those kind of tests. And we never really pulled it off, but we did all the background research, and that's why I was looking at the literature on the viruses and pH to sort that out. One of the things that Casey recommended was that citrus diet. That's one reason I tried it on myself, where I just had citrus for two or three or four, and even up to five days of just citrus. I usually do that like in January or February, where I was, because that's the best time to get the fruit from Florida. We couldn't get it. You don't grow it in Virginia Beach, but at least it was readily available, fairly fresh. And um, it did have a very strong... Uh, effect on me in terms of alkalinity. He said you can measure it with litmus from salivation uh, from the spittle. Hear it again, saliva or urine, testing it. And then alkalize with lemons, especially, or lemon and orange, which I like to do. I take the orange juice and squeeze some lemon in. This would norm, uh, materially aid in keeping a better normal equilibrium if this is done. Once a week or like, don't take an excess of alkalinity alkalines unless there is indicated an acidic reaction. So I was sort of experimenting on myself. I probably didn't need to become that alkaline, but I just wanted to see. I, I wasn't too worried about having too much of a reaction because I tend to keep a pretty good balance otherwise. So we used, we actually did a, some research with this using this digital tester. We had a group of people came in in one of our residential programs and let's see how many people was there. 16 individuals. This was for about a week. Now, we were doing the Casey diet, so we hired a cook. We had them staying in a hotel that we'd rented. And so they were eating the Casey diet, presumably mostly. Of course, they could choose for themselves, 80% alkaline, 20. That was what we were preaching to them. Of course, if you have acid and alkaline sitting there in a buffet-type table or people can choose, you can't stop them from taking all acid. You know, if they want to stock up and have all the acid stuff, you, you know, we, we suggest that they try to stick with the diet, but some people can do that better than others, and some people struggle with that. But we actually measured, we, we did urine samples, so we did 472 urine samples. They collected it in the little white cups that I showed you a minute ago. They'd bring it in, and Debbie Thompson, the nurse who was working with us and I, would measure those and track them all. And over the period of a week, um, you see, if you can notice, statistically it was significant. There is an increase toward alkalinity as the week went on, following the KC diet. And on, notice where the big spike is right there on the 17th. Now, the, the blue is percentage of persons 7.0 or greater. In other words, percentage of people who are alkaline, and the red is a sample of 7.0 or greater. And on that day, we asked them to do as much as possible, do citrus the whole day. Just do citrus. And we offered it to them. And for the most part, they followed it pretty closely. And look what happened. Everybody got, got alkaline during the day. At some point in their samples, everybody at least got to the alkaline, which is much better than they had been doing. And there was also, on average, a pretty big spike in alkalinity. So that showed to us what Casey said about taking the citrus, and it would produce the alkaline effect. There it is in that spike. Of course, Debbie Thompson said she couldn't drink out of a white cup after that for a long time. <laughs> Good sport. Debbie's so nice to work with. What a sport. I wrote this up. Uh, we wrote this up as in a paper and presented it uh, at, at the health symposium, and it's on the Meridian Institute website. So if you want to see all the technical stuff, how we did it and everything, it's all there. Okay, so you can achieve the optimal acid-alkaline balance by testing your pH and knowing your own body and adjusting your lifestyle to keep a balance with diet, exercise, internal cleansing, that toxicity thing that we've talked so much about, the glycothymoline, that alkaline mouthwash could be helpful, and relaxation can all be, help you keep a balance in the acid-alkaline dimension.
So, in, I'm winding up here. What have I got? A few minutes left? Somebody help me. I'm going for 10, 15, is it? I got seven minutes? Close. Okay, so I wanted to have some time for some questions, but we'll just wrap this up quickly. Um, keeping a balance. Holism, oneness, spiritual, mental, physical. They are one. Practice moderation in all things. Avoid extremes. Budget your time. Live a balanced lifestyle. Work, love, and play. Use the radio appliance when needed. Get adequate exercise. And if you need that upper, lower balance, I've shown you what that's about. You can check that out with some of the exercises and the readings as well. Keep the assimilations and eliminations balanced. And maintain proper acid alkaline or pH balance. Balanced living. Now, there's a lot more ways you can work with balance, but these are the ones that I'm most familiar with because I've worked in my own life, so I feel better talking about that. Does that make sense to you? Keeping a balance, so important.